The year is 1981. I'm going to Sandy Hill Camp nestled in a quiet community overlooking the Chesapeake Bay in Northeast Maryland, and we live in a suburb of Philadelphia, so this feels far away from home to me. I'm 10 years old, and although I attended this camp last year, this is the first time that I'm spending all summer away at camp. I'm an awkward kid. I like to sing, tell jokes, perform magic tricks. <laughs> All things that get me labeled, among other things, as a sensitive artistic type. <laughs> I'm also underdeveloped, one of the smallest in my age group. And although I'm not shy, I'm always afraid that other kids won't like me. Fitting in is sometimes hard for me, and my most desperate need is for other kids to like me. This is a particularly vulnerable time for me as my parents recently got divorced, and my sense of security and well-being has been dramatically altered. It's about halfway through the camp season, and we're given an option to go on a one-week canoe trip down the Delaware River. I immediately decide I want to go, but I'm also petrified. There would only be about 10 campers and two counselors on this trip, and there'd be absolutely nowhere for me to hide. What if the other kids don't like me? What if we have to do something on this trip that I can't do? I am always the last one chosen for any kickball team, baseball team, soccer team, any sport. I decide to do it, but I am very nervous. I meet the other boys who will be on the trip, and all of them are older than me by a couple of years. That may not sound like very much, but at 10 years old, a 12-year-old is very intimidating. <laughs> I am already worried about fitting in as we drive to the spot we were entering the river for the first day. The days are spent on the river learning how to navigate and make camp. The nights are harder for me. The campfire time on this trip is filled with sex talk and dirty jokes, neither of which I understand. <laughs> Masturbation is a common discussion topic, and I'm not even really sure what that is. <laughs> All I really know is it's something naughty that the other boys are both proud and a little embarrassed about. It's a very confusing topic. I'm most in awe of one of the counselors, Eric. He's a college athlete, and he can do a standing jump over a rope that's hung higher than his waist. He's very nice to me and always tries to include me in activities and conversation. We're about halfway through our week-long journey when we get word that a rapid up ahead has just been given a number six rating, the highest rating that there is for a rapid. This is of great concern to our counselors as a number six rapid is no joking matter. If your canoe gets turned sideways and you come across a large enough rock, not only will your canoe get bent around that rock permanently, you could most certainly die in the battle. We paddle up at the beginning of these rapids and our counselors have us walk our canoes to the shallow shoreline and pull them up on shore. We walk down river where a crowd is gathered to watch people attempt to pass through the ferocious rapids. What we see is scary. People are struggling to get through the rapids safely, and we watch a few near misses where a canoe is almost capsized in the treacherous water. Then along comes an older couple, probably in their 70s. They pick their path through the rapids and glide through them with hardly any effort. It's remarkable. The counselors discuss our options, and Eric then decides that he wants to give it a try. He looks over all of us, and he points a finger at me, and he says, Rob, you're the most experienced here. You and I are going. This was the first time I'd ever been picked first for anything in my life. <laughs> I was so excited, which was followed immediately by an extreme sense of panic. What am I doing? I've been canoeing on lakes all of my life. The only thing I know about river canoeing is what I've learned on this trip. I don't even have time to process this, and before I know it, Eric gets in the back of the canoe and I'm in the bow. I kneel down in front of the seat in order to have more control over the canoe with my paddle. We bring the canoe to the mouth of the rapid and we head in. The first thing that strikes me is the sound. At first it's high pitched, a soothing, constant swoosh noise. Then as we get closer to the really big rapids, there's an extremely low pitched growling that I can not only hear, but I can feel everywhere. We bounce off of a few rocks, and I'm yelling out commands. Rock starboard, now port, port! And the closer we get to the heart of the rapids, the more I realize that my yelling is a lost cause. 
I cannot possibly be heard over the roar of the rapids. The water seems colder here, and every wave that splashes into the canoe sends an immediate chill over my body. It is both shocking and disorienting. What started as a challenging exercise is quickly turned into a feat of survival. I have so little control over the direction of the canoe. We're at the mercy of where the river wants to take us. The nose of the canoe keeps getting thrust under the water, and cold water slams into me, making me blind for brief moments. Large rocks seem to pop out out of the water with increasing speed, and we get bumped and jostled as we careen through the water. I glance back to Eric, who's leaning so far back on his paddle that I think he may fall backwards into the water. And then I see it. A large rock is approaching, and our canoe is drifting sideways. I dig my paddle in the water between the canoe and the direction of the rock, and I hold on with all of my might. I look back, and Eric has now turned around backwards and paddling like mad against the river to try to get the canoe back on track. We just get it turned as we brush past the rock, and my paddle is thrown up in the air. The thrust rips the paddle from my left hand and bends my right hand back behind me as the paddle slams into the middle of the canoe. We glide for a second, and then the sound starts to dissipate. I look down river and the, river, the water is, is much calmer. I sit back in the seat and we both start laughing. We had no idea what we were getting into and we realize how lucky we are to be unharmed, still in the canoe and paddling safely to shore. We pull the canoe onto the grass and Eric leaves me to go tell the rest of the group to walk their canoes around the rapid. <laughs> No one else in our group will be attempting that journey. I sit by myself on the side of the river, and I'm filled with a powerful sense of accomplishment. My adrenaline is pumping, and I feel grateful to be alive, but more than that, I'm proud. I'm proud of what I just did and proud that I was chosen to be the one to attempt it. I've never felt this way before. It is euphoric. Later, we learn that the old couple that we saw go through the rapids so effortlessly have lived on that river all their lives. <laughs> and they make this trip almost daily. <laughs> they know this rapid and they know it well. Things are a little different between me and the other boys. I'm no longer trying to fit in or worried about what they think of me. I spend more time on my own and I'm peaceful in a way that I don't think I've ever experienced before. Over the years, I learned that very few people have successfully navigated number six rapid. Very few even attempt it. I'm a 41-year-old man now, and I've had a number of accomplishments that I am proud of. But there are still times today that that same feeling of wanting to fit in and wanting other people to like me comes up. But, and at these times, I don't always think of my experience on the Delaware River. But thanks to Eric and being picked first just that once, and the sense of peace that has never left me from the shoreline that day, I have a confidence that I can make it through, and that being liked doesn't matter near as much as how I feel about myself when no one else is around. <laughs>